You're listening to The Jacob Vaught Show. He's breaking down the latest and greatest in sports as only he can. Follow him on Twitter at Real Jacob Vaught. Here he is. Jacob Ball. Hello, sports fans. Welcome to another edition of the Jacob Volk Show. I am Jacob Volk. And there is a lot to get to today, starting with the MLB schedule being altered because the Miami Marlins have had a rash of coronavirus cases. There are four main bullet points that you need to know. All Marlins games are postponed through Sunday. So, they will go a week without playing. A full week. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. That's seven days. A full week without playing. The remainder of this week's Phillies-Yankees games have been postponed. The Yankees were set to play the Phillies in a home-and-home. Two in Philly, and then two in the Bronx. That's not going to happen. The Phillies aren't going to play until Friday when they will face the Blue Jays. Interestingly enough, that is set to be a Blue Jays home game, but they're going to play at Citizens Bank Park. Evidently, Salen Field couldn't get ready in time. The Nationals are set to play the Blue Jays. They're doing a home-and-home, two as home games for them, and two as visiting games. But all four games are going to be at Nationals Park. I guess it doesn't matter with no fans in the stands, but it's kind of weird. Do they have to go into different clubhouses? Because each stadium has a home clubhouse and a visiting clubhouse and different staffs and all that stuff. Would the Nationals have to go into the visiting clubhouse? Would the Phillies have to go into the visiting clubhouse at their own home stadiums? I'm actually kind of interested in that. I really want to know that. For whatever reason, Sal and Field just couldn't get ready in time. Hopefully they're still working on it. Hopefully it'll get done soon. The Yankees and Orioles are going to start a two-game series at Camden Yards tonight. Both of those games will be 735 starts. So finally, we get to see Yankee baseball again. Two days off. Garrett Cole gets to start again. Let's go. You teased me with showing me the Yankees three times, and then you took them away for two days. Those were really painful two days. I mean, I'll tell you. That was rough. There will be scheduling alterations for next week, and those will be announced at a later date. But you've thrown such a monkey wrench into this schedule that you're left with Two options. Number one, everyone finishes the season with a different number of games played. And we just decide who makes the playoffs based on winning percentage. We've done that before. In 1981, that was done. It's not a perfect solution, but it may be the best one. Or you forfeit games. I mean, think about it. If the reason the game isn't being played is your fault, why wouldn't you just have one nothing games? That's it. You lost. Game over. Before it ever starts. 
I don't mind that. That's more fair to a team like, let's say the Yankees. If they don't make up the four Yankees-Phillies games that are now being missed. There are supposed to be four games this week between the Yankees and Phillies. God only knows if they're going to play those games. It's the Phillies' fault. There was a coronavirus outbreak in their city. The Yankees are fine. The Yankees are willing to play. The Phillies are the ones that are saying, whoa, hold on, we can't play. I understand it's more on the Marlins than it is the Phillies, but still, it happened in Philadelphia. That's on the Phillies. It's not on the Yankees. Forfeit those games to the Yankees. Because if you do it by winning percentage, the Yankees could be screwed out of wins. And that may affect their playoff seating. I'm not saying this is a Yankee fan. But the Yankees did everything right. The Phillies are the ones that need to quarantine and get the negative COVID tests. The Yankees are fine. Why should the Yankees be punished for something that the Marlins and Phillies did? Maybe you think it's too harsh to put this on the Phillies, but again, it happened in Philadelphia. If they can't play because they need COVID tests, that's on them. Yeah, it's unfair. I understand that. But that's the nature of the beast. That's what we signed up for here. We knew this was a possibility. You want to tell me that they're just going to make up those games later? Look, they don't have a lot of time to do that. The Yankees and Phillies only have two common off days. And if I remember correctly, the day before both of those mutual off days, the Yankees will be in New York. The Phillies will be in Florida. And one of those games is supposed to be a Sunday night game. You would need to change that Sunday night game to make it an afternoon game so the Phillies can go to New York or go to Pennsylvania to make up those games. Maybe you can have some double headers. I don't mind that. But this is a huge monkey wrench, and Major League Baseball needs to figure this out quickly. They can't kick the can down the road and not give teams a lot of advance notice. I mean, one thing that could happen, the Yankees and Orioles were set to play next week. They were set to play August 3rd, August 4th, and August 5th. A Monday, a Tuesday, and a Wednesday. Those Monday-Tuesday games have been moved up to tonight and tomorrow. So, what Major League Baseball could do is schedule double headers on both those days to get in the four games. Or, you do a double header on Monday to make up the Yankee home games, because the Yankees are going to be home this weekend to host the Red Sox. That's a Friday, Saturday, Sunday series. So that Monday, the Phillies could come into the Bronx and play a doubleheader. Both teams get Tuesday off. And then Wednesday, they can travel to wherever they need to go. The Yankees will travel to Baltimore. And the Phillies will travel to Miami. I mean, the one downside to that is the Yankees are going to have an extra off day. 
they'll be off that Tuesday, the Phillies would need to get to Miami quickly because they don't have Tuesday off. They have a series in Miami Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday next week. If you're confused, join the club. All right? I have no idea if what I've said makes any sense. Listening back to it, I'll find out. But if your head is spinning, again, join the club. This is what Major League Baseball signed up for. All right, they didn't follow the appropriate protocols here. Dr. Anthony Fauci liked the bubble idea. He called the NBA bubble creative. He didn't say anything about Major League Baseball. Yeah, he threw out the first pitch at the Yankees-Nationals game to start off the season. That doesn't mean he endorsed the whole season. You want to tell me it couldn't be done? There weren't enough stadiums? There weren't enough hotels? Then just cancel the season. If it can't be done safely, don't do it at all. You invited this headache, Major League Baseball, Rob Manfred. Now you have to live with it. Now you are facing crazy situations where you may have forfeits, you may have teams finishing with not the same amount of games played, you may have crazy makeup games. I don't know. All I know is, if there was a bubble, I don't want to say definitively that this wouldn't have happened, but it would have been a lot less likely. Because the NBA is going to get off the ground tomorrow. They've had scrimmage games. It's gone perfectly. It's gone about as well as it can go. Yeah, you have some people acting like idiots. And of course you have people opting out. Of course you have some positive tests. But that's to be expected. The NHL is going to get off the ground this weekend. The MLS has been going strong. They've had two teams withdraw, but they've been able to manage it. Even the WWE has been hosting events at Full Sail University, where I go to school. I'm an online student there. They received a lot of heat for that. That's sort of kind of a bubble. I don't know what they're doing for housing, but that's similar to the bubble concept. And it's working. I haven't heard any stories about a bunch of coronavirus cases in the WWE. I think I've heard stories about a few coronavirus cases, but not a whole hell of a lot. They're still having events. They're still having pay-per-views. They're still having Raw. They're still having SmackDown. Yeah, I used to be a big wrestling fan. If the WWE, a fake sports company, realize that's not a sport, that's choreographed. If they can get this right, why can't Major League Baseball and to the NFL, please, 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 for the love of God, get a bubble going. Send everyone to a state like Texas. The only state that I can think of that would have enough football fields. You have high school fields. You have college fields. You have some NFL stadiums. Get a bubble going or else you're going to have the same issue. I understand it's going to be incredibly tough. You're going to have to figure out Lodging for over 1,700 people. But it's the NFL. It's one of the biggest companies in the world. They bring in billions of dollars a year. They've got to be able to do it. If the NBA and the NHL can, granted, on a lower scale, but they bring in less money. 
The MLS brings in less money, and they've gotten it done. If those companies can do it, the NFL can. If they don't do a bubble, what we're seeing now in Major League Baseball will repeat itself in the National Football League. I mean, one tough thing about doing a Texas bubble is you're going to have teams traveling to different cities. That's undeniable. The NBA and the MLS, you're all staying in one city. You're all staying in Orlando. The NFL isn't going to be able to do that. Here's my idea for a Texas bubble, and it's more like Texas bubbles. I have no idea if this can be done. This is just me thinking. You've got three big areas in Texas. You've got Dallas, Fort Worth, Houston, And either San Antonio or Austin. I promise you that Dallas-Fort Worth has at least five, maybe six stadiums that you could turn into NFL stadiums. Same thing for Houston. Possibly San Antonio. Possibly Austin. Those are huge cities. And again, you have high school football, you have college football, and you have some NFL stadiums. Some of those college stadiums are nicer than NFL stadiums. You would need to find 16 suitable stadiums. So yeah, one city would have one more. What are you going to do? Each team would have a designated home stadium. You would need to put the five teams or six teams that have a quote-unquote home stadium in a Dallas-Fort Worth area in a Dallas-Fort Worth bubble. The same thing with the Houston teams and the same thing with the San Antonio or Austin teams. The tricky thing is going to be getting teams from one bubble to another. Because realize, each team has 13 opponents. Regardless of the team, that's the number of opponents that you face each year. You're going to need to go from bubble to bubble. But technically, it's possible The NHL is doing it. It's not like Disney, where you have a cordoned off area. Those teams are going from the hotel to the arena on public roads. It's just that simple. I understand it's a short trip, but if done safely, you can expand that. Technically, if you did it safely, there's nothing stopping you from you driving from New York to California right now. It's possible you may have to quarantine in certain states. If the governor there has said, if you're traveling from this state, you've got to stay for two weeks before you can leave. But other than that, you could do it. You can do it safely. Of course you can. Play a game on Sunday, or Thursday, or Monday, whatever. Rest the day after, and then make your way to the next bubble. It can be done. If done safely, you know, if you disinfect the bus or buses, you can do it. Maybe flights. 
It would have to be in private airports, though. Which I guess could be done. But that's the only way to do an NFL bubble, as I see it. Look, I understand it's complicated. I understand that there are a lot of moving parts. But if you want football this season, that's what you have to do. I don't think you can trust a team to travel from one coast to the other. It doesn't work. I mean, I'll use the Jets as an example. Week 5, they play the Cardinals at MetLife Stadium. The week after, they're set to fly to Los Angeles to face the Chargers. How is that going to work? And then the next week, they're flying back from Los Angeles to MetLife Stadium. It can't be done. You have to stay in a bubble. You can't travel from coast to coast. Even Major League Baseball knew that. They did the season geographically. I understand that the NFL doesn't have that luxury. But with a bubble... It can be done. Yeah, no fans in the stands. I understand that. It stinks. You're losing a lot of money. But that's the only way to do it safely. It's the only way to do it properly. It's either that or we're going to have a repeat of what we're seeing now with the Marlins in the NFL. I promise you. Speaking of the NFL, there was a blockbuster extension signed. Joey Bosa signed a five-year extension with the Chargers for $135 million. He's getting a $78 million signing bonus and $102 million in overall guarantees. That shatters the record for highest contract by a defensive player in the NFL. Miles Garrett set that record a couple weeks ago. Joey Bosa just destroyed it. By $2 million, he is now the highest paid player in the NFL when it comes to defense when you look at average salary. Bosa is now getting $27 million a year. He is getting more money guaranteed in any sense of the word than any defensive player has ever gotten. Khalil Mack had a signing bonus of $60 million. Bosa just shattered it. By $18 million. Contract value. Bose is tied for second among defensive players. Mack still holds the record there, but Bose is tied with Aaron Donald. This is a stunning extension. And I'm not in love with it. I don't hate it. I understand the talent that Joey Bosa is. But this is a guy who's had injury concerns. He missed some games his rookie season. He missed some games, not this past season, the season before. He's never played 900 snaps in a season. His career high was at his sophomore year, 850. That's risky. It's a risky bet. This is a lot of guaranteed money to a guy who has injury concerns. I understand the talent that Bosa is. And the Chargers are in a pretty good position with the salary cap. They moved on from Phillip Rivers. They moved on from Melvin Gordon. They don't have a lot of big contracts on their books. So, they really had no reason not to extend Bosa. 
I don't hate this deal. I know why they did it. Joey Bosa is one of the best defensive players in the NFL. He just has a ton of injury concerns. And to give a guy like that over $70 million in a signing bonus and over $100 million guaranteed is ridiculous. That's hard to justify. No matter how talented you are. This could blow up in the Chargers' face. It's not a terrible move. Like I said, I know why Tom Telesco did it. But I don't love it. This is really, really risky. Way too much of a gamble for my blood. Moving on now to Dusty Baker. He will be the Astros' manager next year. The Astros saw something that they liked very early on, and they exercised their team option on his contract. I'm not a big Dusty Baker fan. He's not a good postseason manager. He's great in the regular season, but when it comes to big games... He's just not that good. He's never won a World Series as a manager. In fact, he's only won one pennant, 2002. Now, granted, he came close to winning that World Series. The Giants were very close to winning Game 6. They blew it. Game 7, they couldn't win it. Then in 03, the Bartman game happens. And that's pretty much it. That's the most playoff success that Dusty Baker has had. But I know why the Astros did this. They wanted some continuity. Obviously, a tumultuous offseason for them, regardless of the coronavirus, with the science-dealing stuff, Jeff Luno and A.J. Hinch being removed. Um, By the way, shout-out to Joe Kelly for throwing at Carlos Correa. He's my new favorite Dodger. I want him on the Yankees yesterday. Okay? I I never thought I would have a favorite Dodger, but I do. It's Joe Kelly. I have a favorite Met. It's Luis Castillo. I, believe it or not, actually did have a favorite Red Sox. It was Jacoby Ellsbury because his name was very close to mine. I now have a favorite Dodger. It's Joe Kelly. Shout out to him. It's actually funny. Kelly is a former Red Sox. I don't hate the decision to get some continuity. I just didn't like the Baker hire from the beginning. I understand veteran presence to guide the Astros through this. Again, even before the coronavirus. But the lack of playoff success is just hard for me to get past. I think Baker is one of the more overrated managers in the sport. Him and Buck Showalter. You ever notice how all of Showalter's teams get better right after he leaves? People always say, oh, he left them in a good place. No. It's because he left. Buck Showalter left his Yankees manager in 1995. Joe Torre led them to a World Series the year after. Showalter left his manager of the Diamondbacks. Bob Brenly won a World Series with him. I'm not a Showalter fan. Never have been. Moving on now to the Sonny Milano extension. He will get a two-year extension from the Ducks for a grand total of $3.4 million. I gotta say, I like this move for the Ducks. Always liked Milano. Local kid from Massapequa. Not that far from my house. I understand he hasn't had a lot of NHL success. He really only has two full seasons in the NHL. And both of those seasons, he only played 55 games. But he put up over 20 points both of those seasons. He's a solid third liner. He's not great. He's not terrible. This is a good move to keep him in the fold. It's not a lot of money. I can get behind it very easily. I don't mind this move for the Ducks at all. All Alright, it's time for decades of dumbass decisions. (laughs) 
I'm going to finish up the Sweet 16 today. And as I'm looking at the bracket, I just noticed something, and it's really not that good. Assuming I do one section per day, like finish up the Sweet 16, then the Elite 8, then the Final Four, then the uh, Championship game, that'll put me to Monday or Tuesday, when the NBA and NHL will be back in full swing. I don't want to do that. I don't want to do decades of dumbass decisions that late. So what I'm going to do is, on Friday, I'm definitely going to recap the two NBA games. After that, assuming there's no other sports news, I'll do the Final Four and then the championship matchup. And even if there is other sports news, I'll just talk about that and then I'll finish up decades of dumbass decisions. So I'm going to finish up the Sweet 16 today, starting with the Yankees. It's the 2003 World Series versus the 2001 World Series. 03, they went up against the Marlins after the great Game 7 comeback against Pedro and the Red Sox. Grady Little leaving Pedro in too long. Aaron Boone hits the walk-off home run against Tim Wakefield, a guy who he had historically struggled against. The Marlins vastly outpitched the Yankees, and that was the seminal reason why they lost. The Marlins were a vastly inferior team, No one had ever heard of guys like Josh Beckett and Brad Penny and Carl Pavano. The Yankees were expected to win that series easily. Instead, they were stifled by no names. That's going up against the 2001 World Series with the entire nation rooting for them. After 9-11, the only time all of America, except Arizona. Arizona rooted for the Diamondbacks, obviously. But every other state was rooting for the Yankees. The only time that's happened. They have some great comebacks off Young Young Kim in the Bronx. The series goes to a Game 7. Mariana Rivera comes in to preserve a one-run Yankee lead. He promptly chokes the game away. He allows a single to Mark Grace. Damian Miller hits a ground ball right back to Rivera. And then he messed up the throw. Tony Womack hits an RBI double. Luis Gonzalez hits the walk-off single to win the game. Again, another case of the Yankees losing to an inferior team. But the Marlins were more inferior. The Diamondbacks had three players that year that had great seasons. Luis Gonzalez, Randy Johnson, and Curt Schilling. Fantastic seasons. Can't take anything away from them. The Marlins had some good players too, but... None as dominant as those guys. Mike Lowell had a good year. Derek Lee had a good year. Um, Juan Encarnacion. Ivan Rodriguez dominated that whole postseason. Mark Redman pitched well. Dontrell Willis had a fantastic rookie season. Josh Beckett pitched great. But... None of them were as good as Johnson, Schilling, and Gonzalez. Because the Marlins were worse and the Yankees lost to them, the 2003 World Series advances, setting up something kind of interesting. 03 versus 04. 
So I have scientifically proven that the Yankees had the worst two years of their franchise's existence in back-to-back years in my lifetime. That's pretty interesting. Moving over now to the Islanders, we have Alexi Yashin versus the 2000 Draft. Mike Milbury made a blockbuster trade for Yashin in advance of the 2001 Draft. He traded Bill Muckle, Zdeno Chara, and the second overall pick, which the Senators would ultimately use on Jason Spezza. For Yashin, a disgruntled star. He had rubbed a lot of people in Ottawa the wrong way. Wasn't a good teammate. Wasn't good in the community. Great on the ice. Just couldn't get along with anyone. Millberry then signed him to a mammoth contract. Ten years worth $87.5 million. It was insane at the time, and you know what? It's still insane. Yashin had some good regular season moments, but when he needed to produce in the playoffs, he really didn't. The Islanders never won a playoff series with him. In the 04 playoffs, he fell flat, only had one assist. In 07, he was on the fourth line at some points. Didn't record a single point. Absolutely terrible Islander. That's going up against the 2000 draft. Mike Milbury trades Roberto Luongo and Ole Jokinen to the Panthers for Mark Parrish and Oleg Kavasha. He traded Luongo so that he could draft Rick DiPietro first overall. DiPietro had some good seasons for the Islanders, but then was signed to another terrible contract. 15 years worth $67.5 million. Two years after signing that mammoth extension, DiPietro got bit by the injury bug hard. From the 08-09 season to the 12-13 season, DiPietro only played in 50 NHL games. That's a total of five seasons where he only played an average of 10 games per year. And he was getting paid over $4 million a year. And the Islanders had him for a long, long, long time. Thank God the new CBA included an amnesty clause. So DiPietro is still getting paid. He just doesn't count against the cap. Instead of DiPietro, the Islanders could have had Danny Heatley or Marion Gabrick. The Islanders also had the fifth overall pick in that draft. They picked Rafi Torres. One pick later, Scott Hartnell was picked. It comes down to who would you rather have. Would you rather have Chara and Spezza? Or would you rather have Luongo, Jokinen, Hartnell, and Heatley or Gabrick. I'd rather take those four guys over Chara and Spezza. The 2000 draft is worse. Moving on now to the Jets, we have John Idzik versus the 1982 AFC title game. This one was really tough. John Idzik was GM of the Jets for only two years. In those two years, he ran the Jets into the ground, did nothing in free agency. Yeah, he signed Eric Decker and Brino Giacomini. whoop de freaking do You know what? He didn't sign a single cornerback. Even when Darrell Rivas fell into his lap, 
he allowed Revis to go to the Patriots. He had Dominique Rogers Cromartie ready to sign. He just couldn't close the deal. DRC went to the Giants. He whiffed on Alter on Werner, Brandon Flowers. It was a joke. He was a terrible drafter, also. He picked D. Milliner with the ninth overall pick. Bust. He picked Geno Smith in the second round. Bust. The Itzik 12. Only one of them, Quincy Nunwa, had a really good NFL career. Some of them had decent careers, but nothing great. Inunwa was the best one, and all due respect to Inunwa, if he's the best player in your draft class, you didn't do a great job. He never made a Pro Bowl. He never had a thousand yard season. Never caught more than four touchdowns. I like Inunwa a lot. I'm really sad that I'm probably never going to see him play football again. But he can't be the best player in your draft class. Especially when you had 11 other chances to find someone. And Inunwa was picked in the sixth round. Great steal, but that just doesn't work for me. That's going up against the A.J. Dewey game. He's still going. The day before the 82 AFC title game, it rained like a bandit in Miami. Don Shula wisely chose to leave the tarp off the Orange Bowl. So it slowed down the Jets. They were a really speedy offense that year. And they could get nothing going. Richard Todd was dreadful. 15 for 37 for just 103 passing yards and 5 interceptions. Freeman McNeil, 17 rushes for only 46 yards. The low light of the game... A.J. Dewey with a pick six to ice the game for the Dolphins, 14 to nothing. He's still waiting for a Jet to touch him. As bad as that loss was, and it is the worst playoff loss in Jets history, John Idzik is worse. Maybe I'm showing my age, or lack of age, but those two seasons... And watching those teams, watching him do nothing in free agency, watching him mangle the draft, was so blasted painful. I mean, he picked a wide receiver in the fourth round, Jalen Saunders, the worst special teamer I've ever seen in my life. Saunders, I think, only made it two or three games for the Jets. I don't think he made it out of the month of September. Can you imagine how bad you have to be to be cut as a fourth rounder? That's Ja'Kai Polite bad. Moving over now to the Nets, we have Drazen Petrovic's death versus the 2009 to 2010 offseasons. Drazen Petrovic, in his last two seasons in the NBA had established himself as one of the best players in the NBA. Unfortunately, he died in a fatal car accident. It set the Nets back almost a decade. Oh, what could have been if Petrovic had stayed healthy. I don't know if they would have beaten the Knicks in 94, but I guarantee you they wouldn't have gotten swept. Maybe they would have made the playoffs some other years. History would have been a lot different, I promise you that. That's going up against the 2009 to 2010 offseasons. The 09 offseason saw the Nets pull the plug on their really good teams earlier that decade. Vince Carter was traded along with Ryan Anderson to the Magic. For three guys who did nothing for the Nets. And Rafer Alston, Tony Batty, and Courtney Lee. 
I'm not saying they were bad players. They had good careers outside of their time with the Nets, but look, when you trade Vince Carter and Ryan Anderson too, I mean, come on, you've got to get something in return. They gave them away. The Nets literally gave those guys away. They suffer through a 12-70 and 70 season, one of the worst seasons in NBA history. They get off to the worst start in NBA history. They lost their first 18 games. Somehow they think they're a premier free agent destination. That's what they sold their fan base on. We have the billionaire owner and Prokhorov coming in. He's going to spend a bunch of money. We have Brooke Lopez, we have Devin Harris, we're moving to Brooklyn, don't worry Nets fans, we'll be fine. And they get no one in that stacked free agency class. They settled on Jordan Farmar, Anthony Morrow, Travis Outlaw, and Johan Petro. Morrow and Farmar were solid players, but nothing great. Outlaw was massively overpaid, five years at 35 mil. Trust me, that was an overpay at the time. And Johan Petro was terrible. That is worse than the death of Petrovic to me. Again, I may be showing my age, but just suffering through that 12 and 70 season, seeing Vince Carter get traded, seeing every team in the NBA get a really good to great player, except my team. That's worse to me. Until tomorrow, I am Jacob Volk saying that the best way to stop Ty Cobb from hitting was to take a gun and shoot him.